So any questions on, on the final, either date, time, location, what to expect, format? Same as before, 50 questions. Okay, we'll have some on the screen. This room, yep, right in this room. Everything will be mostly the same. Okay, it's really more like an exam three than the final. But uh, there's probably a little bit more review content because the front half of the semester is a little heavier, and so we don't have as much content on the third so that I can put some more review questions in there. Make sense? How many of you are sick of uh, Thanksgiving leftovers, though? Oh, gosh, I'm tired of leftovers. So, looking like we had spaghetti last night. It tasted so good. <laughs> I don't think there are any Italians at Thanksgiving, the original Thanksgiving meal. So, <clears throat> all right. Anybody get up to the mountain yet? Yeah, that was boring. Well, I was there this morning, and then I came in. So, all right, let's talk about uh, a couple of critical questions for you. Ready? What do you call a cow with a twitch? I'm looking at you because you always get up. Beef jerky. Oh. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, how about this one? Um, what type of music do mummies sing in the shower? This is one of my kids. What's that? Rap music. Rap music. Very good. Rap music. Okay, how about this one? This is a nerd joke. I hope, I hope you like it. What did the brother sell say to his sister when she stepped on his toe? My toe, sis. Very good. You guys are ready for the final. You are ready for the final. You're getting the jokes. Look at that. That was well done. Very well done. Okay. So only two more lectures. Um, everything's streaming online okay? Is that resource still valuable for you guys? Super valuable. Super valuable? Okay. It sounds like it's still pretty rare, which amazes me. I guess there's not a lot of other professors that do it yet? Yeah. Okay. Oh, they do? No, they don't. Oh, they don't? Okay. All right. I'm just trying to make sure that I was aware uh, of what it looked like. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was a recommendation from one of your um, uh, colleagues from years ago saying that it would be nice if, if maybe you could think about recording the lectures and then making them available. So we used to do them audio um, before we had these fancy recording devices, right? that prop up with three by five note cards. You guys see my note cards that I stick in the back there to make the camera angle correct? <laughs> so now that's all documented on the video, you know, but the camera quality has gone way up. So it was just audio and then we, and I got, a, I got into the 21st century with an iPad and, um, and then uh, I got a newer one and this one has a better camera so that's why the quality's a little better. But they have to be on YouTube because um, the first time I tried to load them on BB Learn, it like crashed the network. <laughs> so, God, I got in trouble for that. So, so now YouTube is where everything goes, right? You can learn how to fix your engine and watch pathology. It's an amazing resource. Um, all right. <clears throat> so a little bit about this class. So Iridia's not here. She sent out that message. How many of you have been taking advantage of the SIs? Um, what kind of resource is that? Well, how would you rate that? She's not here, so you can, <laughs> you can talk freely. Although she, she can see it on the video. So. How's that going? What's that? I'd say she's a 10 out of 10. I'd say she's a 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10, you'd say. But it's a resource that you're using and finding helpful. Mm -hmm. That was also feedback that came from some of your previous colleagues. Okay, so there's a theme here of feedback from previous colleagues. All right? So you are benefiting from a lot of the feedback that people before you wrote down. And we, and, and we read them. I read them. I, list, I look at them, every single one of them. They're all anonymous, so, and we don't get the, the feedback until after the semester's closed. So there's no way for me to figure out who it is. You know, some students write their comments, you know, different things, and, and they might put their name if, if they want to be recognized, but you don't have to. Uh, but even still, it doesn't come, come to us until after the semester is uh, closed and the grades are all submitted. So I want to encourage you, you probably have in your inbox um, uh, 
uh, some feedback on the class, and your formal feedback. And, and you can evaluate me, you can evaluate the content, you can evaluate the class. Um, there isn't the lab section, but you can make comments about the SI. Um, and all of these things, even the format of the class, all of them have been based and honed in over the years based upon student feedback. Now, it's, you know, if, if, if students say, hey, you should just hand out all A's and have no exam, it's not like I'm going to listen to that piece of information and we're going to modify the class that way. But if there are legitimate comments that make sense, and the SI one was a comment that said there's so much material in this class, it's hard to know where to focus. Um, we've had SI resources for the 100 and the 200 level classes. Why can't we get it for this class? Well, the first few times I asked for it, uh, the SI department said no that uh, it's for uh, 100 and 200 level classes only. And then um, I kept submitting requests, and then I started turning in feedback from students saying that they wanted an SI. And I said, well, I'm, I'm asking for it again because the students have asked for it. And then the, the comment came back, well, uh, you don't have a high DFW rate. Does anybody know what a DFW rate is? That's a, a D or an F or a withdrawal. And so classes where there's large number of Ds, a large number of Fs, and a large number of withdrawals are the ones that are first in line to get the SI resources, okay? So to my comment was a little sarcastic saying, so I should fail more students and then you'll give me resources. <laughs> that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and then I said, keep in mind, these are very motivated students. These are students that have already been through a lot of these earlier classes, and many of them are pre-med, pre-devil, pre-nursing, um, going to PA school, right? Um, want to move into chiropractic medicine, um, physical therapy. So these are students that aren't just testing the waters, they've already tested the waters, and this is where they're going to be. So why don't we make more resources available to them and encourage them to be successful? And, and, and then I turned in more student feedback, I made copies of them. <clears throat> we finally got our SI resource, okay? So if I didn't have what I would say is the data or the ammunition of student feedback, it would be hard to push. The other one is the format of the class. So some of, I won't ask for a vote because you know who knows how it's going to turn out, but um, some of you like the idea that you only have to come to class once a week. Some students have opted not to come to class, right? Because the lectures are online. And um, if, when I got surveyed from this course years ago, a lot of students are working full time. They're CNAs, okay. They're paramedics, or they're working at uh, at the hospital as a patient safety advocate. Um, they are, you know, I already said CNA. They work. They have to work as a nurse, and they're trying to get into nursing school um, to further their education. So this class we built it, and this is a long time ago, uh, where the language we used to refer to was hybrid. It was called a hybrid class. Then it became like blended or online or non-traditional. There's all these new buzzwords. But in the very beginning, we called that a hybrid class where the idea was to try to put as much material available to you outside of the classroom. And then when we get together, we can minimize the amount of time together so that it's not taking up your schedule and it's not taking up classroom space. And so the idea was to make it more amenable for you guys to work it around your schedule. And that's why we meet once a week. Right? We do a traditional lecture, but the lecture is recorded, and then we make it available online. Okay? So everything down to the way that the class has been structured has been part of student feedback input. All right? So what I would hope that that does for you is encourage you to go in and say, if you, if you like the class the way it is, that's wonderful. But maybe say that and, and give me some information as to why. Okay? Don't just say, oh, yeah, great class, because that doesn't help me. Tell me why it's a great class. And the opposite is true. I hated this class. Tell me why. It doesn't help me if you say this is the worst class ever. You need to tell me why it's the worst class ever. Class ever. Because it gives me some areas that I can work on. And I, I know that it's not perfect. I know that I'm not perfect. But if I don't know what I can work on to improve it, then I don't have anything to go with. Okay? Probably take five, ten minutes of your time. That's it. Okay? So please fill that out. Um, I don't know who's completed it and who hasn't. I just know what number. I just know what number. There's 99 students registered in this class. 
you'll know that that number is true when you come on, on the final. Okay, because you'll look around on the final and go, wow, there's a lot more students here today. Right? That happens on the exams. So 99, it would be nice to get like 70% of the class responding. Okay? So if they're listening to this lecture, those co uh, colleagues of yours that take advantage of the online format, uh, this is all being recorded. So I'm hoping that they're going to take the time, just like you all, and go and provide some feedback. Rate the class. Okay? Any comments or questions about that? Okay. Cool. It's an important metric, not just for me personally, but the department likes to see it, um, the university likes to see it, but again, um, I'm asking you because I look at every single one of those and I have over the years. All right. Cool. We'll switch away from that and we'll get into our lecture. Today we're talking about respiratory diseases. We're going to take a look at four main topics or categories, atelectasis, obstructive pulmonary diseases, restrictive pulmonary diseases, and then infections. We're um, not going to have time to cover anything more than this. This is always kind of the disclaimer in every lecture, is that we're going to touch, you know, the surface. I'm going to give you some exposure, and then from here you can move on and you can investigate other things in your uh, further study. So there's others, but we're not going to have time to go into all of the others. So let's do some definitions like we always do. <clears throat> Does this graph look familiar to you? Maybe it causes twitches or feelings of stress or anxiety. I understand. But so this should be familiar from 202. Right? So this is the point in the lecture where you probably know what's coming. And, and you could probably say it for me. I don't even have to repeat it. But I always say, if this is completely foreign to you, what? Go back and take a look at it. Okay? And students, I get feedback from students on not just this class, but other classes. Like, it really bugs me when professors say that. Like, why don't they just explain it? Well, because there was a whole unit in 202, which is a prereq of this class, where you cover this. And so the way that these courses work is we don't make prereq, prerequisite requirements just because we want to be mean. It's because you're supposed to be building upon your knowledge base. Right? Students are like, oh, I hate cumulative exams. It sucks. Right? Um, well, if you're going to be a physician or a PA or a nurse, guess what? It is cumulative. Right? You can't, you can't be like, you know, uh, doc, if, you know, I, I've got this chest pain. It really hurts. And, I think I have a heart attack. You know what? I already took my exam in the cardiovascular section. I got an A. Right? But I forgot it all. Sorry, man. Okay? Because it's not cumulative. So it's not going to work. So you, you, you're going to, if, if you're rusty, the way to keep things cumulative is to reiterate them. Do it again. And it'll come back to you. Okay? So I understand you don't like when we say that, but there's a reason for it because it's covered before, you're going to be responsible for it. But just real quickly in broad brush strokes, this is time on this access, this is total lung capacity. We have about a six liter lung volume. Okay? If you're taller, it's probably a little bit bigger. If you're shorter, it's a little bit smaller. Okay? So the size of your lungs is more directly proportional to height than it is to any other index. And then the tidal volume, this is, this is the resting inspiration and expiration movement of air, which is about 500 milliliters, half a liter. And then you remember down here, there's about 1.2 liters of residual volume. That's the volume, if you exhaled as much as you possibly could, there's still over a liter of air in your lungs, keeping the airways open, so they don't just collapse down on themselves like a deflated balloon, okay? And then from the bottom point of your tidal volume down to the top of the residual volume, this is your exp expiratory reserve volume. <clears throat> so that's the volume of air that you can expire before you get down to essentially what you cannot move anymore. And then likewise, at the top of the tidal volume upwards is your inspiratory reserve volume. And that's the volume of air you can move above and beyond your tidal volume. Okay. So these metrics on lung movement 
or a volume as it relates to lung movement are terminologies that you found in 202. Okay, they'll be helpful to you in this section just to put things into context. So we're going to look at restrictive diseases and we're going to look at obstructive diseases. And there's a difference. Okay, so we'll go over that. But first, let's talk about eupnea. So eupnea is probably, if you're not wrestling with a, with a cold right now, a chest cold, you have eupnea. You have well breathing as it translates in the Greek. Dyspnea is shortness of breath, okay, abbreviated SOB. I remember the first time I was volunteering in the emergency room, right? There was like a whiteboard, and there was like all these names of their patients, I think just their last name, and then it'd be like SOB, you know, event one, <laughs> SOB, event seven. There's a lot of comfy guys in here, because I thought it was something else. It was shortness of breath, okay? So SOB, shortness of breath, dyspnea. Orthopenia, orthopenia is shortness of breath that occurs when you're um, laying down in the horizontal position. Hyperventilation, right? Ventilation that exceeds metabolic demand. And then hypoventilation would be a patient that's underventilated, so they're not breathing enough. Hypercapnia, high CO2 levels in the blood. Hypocapnia is low CO2 levels in the blood. Hemoptysis. Who do you know what hemoptysis is? Coughing up blood. Very good. Okay. Blood in the sputum. Um, and then cyanosis. Cyanosis is a bluish coloration or a tint to the skin or the mucosa usually indicates that there's a low oxygenation of the tissues. Hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is decreased oxygenation of arterial blood. Arterial blood. And then hypoxia, which is different. Hypoxia is decreased oxygenation of the target cells or the target tissues. So hypoxemia is referring to oxygenation of the blood. Hypoxia is referring to oxygenation levels of the tissues. Okay? So if anything on this list will help you the most in your more recent future, it's going to be the definition of SOB. Trust me. You'll be like, oh, man, I'm so glad you told me that. Okay? Because I thought that man was just going to be grumpy when I walked in. Yeah, question Cyanosis is like, cyan is a blue color, the, the, the uh, crayon cyan, or the color cyan. So cyanosis is a bluish tint or coloration to like the tips of the fingers, or maybe the lips, or the mucosal linings, uh, indicating that there might be low oxygenation in the tissues. It's an indication of hypoxia. What does it turn blue with that? What's that? What is why does it turn blue? Um, it turns blue because if the if the blood capillary network is less oxygenated, then it's less of a reddish brown color and it's more of a bluish red purple color. So like in venous blood, so you know when you look at your textbook, you know the red arteries are always red and the veins are always blue. If you open up a patient, it's more like purple versus bright red. So the purple coloration is more of a less oxygenated blood. There's still oxygen in, in, in the veins. Because There's just not as much. So the partial pressure of oxygen is lower than venous circulation, but it's not completely depleted. And so this is one of the reasons that CPR changed a, a while ago. It used to, now it's just chest compressions when we teach CPR. It used to be chest compressions and you would breathe for the patient periodically, right? You're trying to push in oxygenation, ox, oxygenated um, air into the, into the alveoli. But um, if a patient's passed out, their metabolic demand of oxygen is really low. And so there's still plenty of oxygen on the hemoglobin in the veins. You just, the, if the heart's not moving it, you just need to push on chest compressions and, and manually move the blood around. 
Plus, there was all this concern in patient, or uh, like Good Samaritan rules. People were less likely to help somebody that was a total stranger if they didn't have their little mask in their pocket. Because they didn't want to put their mouth on a stranger's mouth and catch something. And so now we teach CPR without, without breathing, just chest compressions only. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, did I answer your question, the blue? The bluish color is more like purple. It's more of a purple color. So if you have any opportunities to, to be in an open surgery and they're dissecting down an artery main pair, it's easiest to tell when they're side by side because the artery looks bright red. Really, really bright red. Um, and then the vein is not blue, it's more of like a purplish red. Okay? All right. So our first terminology, or our first disease state that we can talk about is atelectasis. So atelectasis, simply put, is lung collapse. So the lungs collapse as a result of inadequate expansion. And if they collapse, they can't inflate fully. Okay, so if you go back to this previous slide, if they co collapse down, then the total lung capacity is diminished. It cuts into the inspiratory reserve volume. So instead of having like three liters of inspiratory reserve volume, you may only have like 1.5. So the patient wouldn't be able to take a deep breath, okay? So atelectasis causes a reduction in oxygenation because you're not able to fully inflate all the alveoli. And if you can't inflate all the alveoli, you're not gonna have appropriate gas exchange. We have three main types. We have resorptive, which is this sort of upper left one. Resorptive prevents air from reaching the distal airways, and it's usually as a result of a obstruction, like a piece of food gets caught in the, in, in, in the airway. Okay, you can kind of see there's a little um, piece of something right there. We'll call it a piece of steak that wasn't chewed enough. The second type is compression, and compression could be from two different sources. One would be uh, a pneumothorax, where the patient actually has a punctured thoracic um, side and air moves in and it disrupts the, the slight negative pressure in the pleural cavity. And so now the lung is being compressed down with atmospheric air. That would be a pneumothorax, okay? Or the second type is a pleural effusion from a patient, and this could come in a variety of different ways. Most commonly is from congestive heart failure. We're gonna talk about congestive heart failure next week. If the heart is not pumping blood appropriately, then you get a lot of fluid back, back up in the heart. And because it back to the heart, the blood flow from the heart goes to the lungs and then back to the heart. If it's backed up at the level of the heart, um, then you're gonna get a lot of fluid in the lungs themselves. There's a second source, patients that wrestle with um, lung cancer. Different types of lung tumors are gonna be very um, aggressive and, and fast growing, and they produce a lot of excess fluid. And those lesions actually can line the pleural space and contribute additional milliliters of fluid. So you and I would probably have about 100 milliliters of fluid in our pleural space around our lungs. And it's a lubricious fluid. That's a fun word to say, lubricious. Try that. Lubricious, yeah. It's a lubricious fluid, right? So it feels kind of like soap. You put soap on your fingers and put it under the sink, it's kind of slippery. And so that fluid that lines your pleural space is slippery, almost like oil. Because you have two linings coming together, so you want them to slide nice and easily. So in patients that have this excess pleural effusion, they may produce 500 to 700 to a liter of fluid per day. And you can imagine if you have that much fluid sitting on your lungs, how difficult it is to take a deep breath. Make sense? And so they'll drain it with a catheter, and they'll pull that fluid off on a daily basis, okay? So a pleural effusion 
from patients with either lung cancer or a lung tumor, or from patients with congestive heart failure. Now the last type, you can see this upper right is showing um, you know, this little cavity of fluid. The, upper, uh, the lower um, picture is contraction. So contraction is fibrotic changes that occur in the lung. And it modifies or it negatively impacts its ability uh, to be elastomeric. Okay, we'll look at some of these diseases that would cause some fibrotic changes that would take place where the lung actually kind of contracts down. Okay, in all of these cases, resorption, compression, or contraction, what's happening at the level of the lung is total lung volume is being compromised. You can't fully inflate, the alveoli are not being um, fully uh, inflated with air to allow for maximum gas exchange. <clears throat> okay, so if we move into our respiratory diseases, we're gonna talk about chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease first. And I want to talk about these as they relate to um, partial or complete blockage of airflow. With obstructive pulmonary diseases, when we say the word obstructive, we're saying it's worse with expiration. There may be problems with inspiration, but they're exaggerated on expiration. And in our obstructive pulmonary diseases, we actually have four, classically, emphysema, bronchitis, asthma, and bronchiectasis. And of those, two of them, the top two, are considered COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Now, they get the, the terminology chronic because they're long-lasting. These are, <clears throat> these are um, diseases that start out at a certain phase of the patient's life, and they last essentially for the lifetime of that patient. Whereas, for example, in asthma, some of you are thinking, wait a second, I have asthma, my brother has asthma, my sister has asthma, um, pretty sure we've had it our whole life. But you're not symptomatic your whole life, okay? So you have <clears throat> asthma that you wrestle with. I have asthma as well. It's not nearly what it was when I was a kid, but um, if I get a chest cold, that's where it goes. It goes like straight to my lungs. Um, so asthmatics are, are, it's under control, because if you have a wheeze, you either take a medication on a daily basis, or you have a rescue inhaler, okay? Uh, or if it gets really bad, you have one of those home breathing machines, like a nebulizer machine. So if you're an asthmatic, it's intermittent symptoms, or they're acute symptoms. They're not for the whole lifetime of the patient, typically. Okay, you usually get something because you can't breathe very well when you go play soccer, ultimate frisbee, or you go skiing or snowboarding. You, you have an asthma attack on a regular basis, so you go see a specialist, and they say, oh, we want to treat you with a long-lasting bronchiodilator, or a local steroidal bronchiodilator that's going to help you out. Okay, so asthma is obstructive, but it's usually not chronic. Make sense? Okay, <clears throat> so as we work our way through this, <clears throat> the first one up on our list, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is emphysema. And we're going to spend a reasonable amount of time on emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and then compare and contrast them. Okay? And that's something that I'd like you to be very familiar with for the exam, is the big differences between emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Okay, and I have a slide that kind of compares and contrasts them. So what is emphysema? So emphysema is a disease state that really affects the asinus. Okay, now the asinus is really consisting of this, so this figure right in the middle, this green figure, the asinus, a normal asinus, is our respiratory bronchial, the alveolar duct, as well as the alveoli, all the alveoli. And so this whole structure is considered the asinus. And this is the location at the very terminal end of the bronchial tree. When you take a deep breath, these are the little bags that inflate. <clears throat> and the architecture of the alveoli Singular is alveolus, is um, 
kind of like a cloud, like a poofy cloud. And the reason that they have all of these folds is to increase surface area so that you can have gas exchange happening across a very thin membrane and the blood vessels are on the other side of that membrane, okay? So if it was just like a balloon that had a smooth surface versus if it's got all of these folds and these tucks, you can imagine if you fully inflated that, you'd actually have a, a larger surface area. And that's what those folds do. So unfortunately, what happens with emphysema is you lose this normal architecture. That's what happens with emphysema. And it's due to a loss of elasticity. And we'll talk about how that happens mechanistically here in a second. But we've got two main types. We've got centra acinar, which is the most common, and we have hanna acinar, which is less common, but still prevalent. And the centra acinar actually targets mostly the respiratory bronchiole, and then the panna acinar targets the alveolus and the alveolar duct. And you see how these things have blown out, and, and we're losing surface area. Some of you are saying, well, it looks like it's bigger. Well, it, it does look big, bigger because it kind of blows out, but as it blows out, it loses a lot of the folding. And so even though it looks ballooned out, it's not as much of a surface area as it was before in a very tight space. And the other thing too is if this happens all over the place, you get overcrowding. And so now you lose, you lose the ability to utilize functional respiratory bronchioles or functional alveoli because they're crowding each other. They're not going to fully inflate. Does that make sense? So if you lose this architecture that's normally supposed to be looking like this, you have a loss of surface area, you get crowding of the alveoli or the respiratory bronchioles, and it ultimately compromises gas exchange. Centra acinar is the most common. It's mostly seen in the upper lung lobes, and it's highly associated with long-term cigarette smoking. And that's the reason that it's the most common. Now, patients do contract emphysema or develop an emphysema <clears throat> that are non-smokers, and they usually are panna acinar. Panna center is more common in the lower lung zone, and it's seen in patients that suffer from what we call an alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. And I'll explain what that means here in the next slide. But this is a sort of a genetic predisposition, and this one is environmentally triggered. Now, could you have a patient that has both? Yeah, you could. And you might have a long-term smoker that unfortunately was genetically predisposed to developing emphysema, and so they you know, develop it early, it's very aggressive, and then you got other patients that smoke their whole life and don't have any emphysema problems. What's up with that? Say, well, the, the, the genes are really strong, okay? So the loss of the elastic recoil that takes place is our primary problem here. And I talked about this alpha-1 antitrypsinase um, disease. And I want to characterize this a little bit more. But let me start out by saying this pathway, this mechanistic pathway that we have, is not completely elucidated. So it's not that we know exactly how this works. That's why it says it's not clear. We have some theories. And what we're going to describe here on this slide are some of the their most prevalent, well-accepted theories. So the idea of, of the development or the beginning, the pathogenesis of, of emphysema is potentially twofold. We could have a protease, anti-protease imbalance. And that's in those patients that wrestle with pan in the center and they're, they test positive for an alpha-1 antitrypsinase disease. What that means is is if you have a protease, a protease is an enzyme that's going to break down a protein. In the case of elastin, if you have a protease elastase, it's going to break down that elastin. Well, you have an anti-protease that keeps it in check. And that anti-protease that keeps it in check prevents too much 
protease in the form of elastase from being pre present in breaking down the elastin composition of the lung tissue. And that's what's normally happening in all of us. But in some patients, there's an imbalance that takes place. Okay? <clears throat> Secondarily, there could be an oxidant antioxidant imbalance, meaning that if a patient has a reactive oxygen species overload due to pollution or contaminants or irritants in the airways, then there are naturally occurring antioxidants that are going to um, check, keep that in check. But if you're delivering polluted air multiple times a day, seven days a week for 30 years, that might develop an antioxidant oxidant imbalance. Make sense? So two pathways, one is environmental, that's the second one, and the other one is more genetic. So if we look at this diagram here, we can see that this is the bloodstream right here. Here's, here's our source of tobacco. A lot of the pollutants that are in, in cigarette smoke um, are in a format that deliver reactive oxygen species or free radicals to the tissue themselves. That can have an activity or a functionality of inactivating the antiproteases within the lung tissue. If you terminate or if you cease these antiproteases, then you kind of allow for the elastase that's manufactured by neutrophils to run rampant. Where are the neutrophils here? Well, the neutrophils are here because if you have irritants coming into the airways, you're going to stimulate an inflammatory reaction. And what were the first cell types to show up in an inflammatory event? Neutrophils. So the neutrophils get recruited, right? They get recruited to the location in the lung tissue. They start pumping out elastics. It's one of the proteases that they manufacture. And this in combination with sort of a freezing or a um, cessation of the antiprotease activity can lead to extra tissue damage within the alveolar airways, right? So here's an alveolar macrophage that's sitting within the acinus, and it can locally crank out um, elastase, and in combination with the free radicals that sort of neutralize um, the antiprotease activity, you start ballooning out and losing your surface area. Okay. Down on this pathway at the bottom is this congenital deficiency. It has nothing to do with the tobacco pathway. So the congenital deficiency is the one that I was referring to earlier. So this is that alpha-1 antitrypsinase deficiency. And there are patients that test positive for this. And so they're more susceptible for developing emphysema, even if they never smoke. And you'll run into that in your, your clinical practice. You're going to run into a couple of things. You're going to run into patients that have emphysema, and I want to make sure you don't jump to the conclusion, well, that they must have been a smoker. Now, it's very possible they weren't, right? So my mother had lung cancer, and she never smoked. But she had a genital um, abnormality or defect that made her susceptible for um, lung tumors. So emphysema patients may not be smokers. Now there's a very high probability that you're gonna see a lot of smokers that, that come into your clinic that, that have emphysema, but that's not always the case. I just wanna make sure you understand, that. okay? Questions on emphysema and sort of the two mechanistic pathways of how patients can develop this, as far as we know it today. Okay, well so the next obvious question, up here's our two pathways. Pathway one, pathway two. The next obvious question is, Okay, what about e-cigarettes, Dr. Keller? I use e-cigarettes, I vape, so I'm safe, right? Be safe, vape, I wanna see that bumper sticker. Well, it's a little early to, I would say, make that definitive claim, okay? Um, again, we're saying not clear, a lot of this is circumstantial, and this is my opinion now, 
Okay, I'm going to take a break. This is my opinion. Do I think that they're safer than traditional cigarettes? Yes, I do. Do I think that they're completely safe with no risks? No, I don't. And the other thing is I don't think we really know what the risks are because they haven't been around that long. Okay? There was a period of time in American history, actually in world history, where we actually thought that cigarettes, traditional cigarettes, were there was nothing wrong with them, right? And it would be really cool because I could be up here like smoking a pipe. And you guys could just be lighting up in this classroom and there'd be like ashtrays built into your chairs, right? Um, on the airplanes, I remember when I was really young, on the airplanes, people would light up as soon as like you get to a certain altitude and like they ring a bell and then the no smoke, they, the old airplanes have like this cigarette with a X through it and it illuminates, it's right next to the, the seatbelt sign and it would go off and then people would light up. And then the next stage was there was a no smoking section, like the back of the plane, like there was some magic, you know, thing that kept the smoke in the back of the plane because you're going 500 miles an hour so the smoke goes this way. <laughs> and now there's no smoking at all, right? And certain sound sounds on there either, but. <laughs> um, so we used to think that regular cigarettes were safe, right? And there was no problem with them. And, uh, and now we, we know better than that, and now there's all these new guidelines and rules and regulations. Some of you hate it, but it's because we've identified that they have health problems associated with them. It takes time to do that. So with electronic cigarettes, um, are they safe? My opinion, this is my opinion, but I would say that the FDA, I, I would say they agree with me, maybe I should say I agree with them. The <laughs> FDA has said that they're not, um, um, they have not identified them as being a safe alternative, okay? So they're typically battery operated, so here's how they work, right? They're battery operated, um, there's a cartridge that holds the nicotine in some sort of solution. Many times it's a propylene glycol. And there's a heater that vaporizes the nicotine. Um, the battery controls all this. And it vaporizes the nicotine into a solution and delivers it uh, as an aerosol into the patient's airways. Okay? Maybe I shouldn't refer to patient, it's in the user's airways, okay? And then, um, a lot of times, like with propylene glycol, because I guess there's a psychology associated with taking a drag where they want to have sort of like the plume come out. Because you can make them where you deliver the nicotine without the plume, but they haven't been nearly as successful in sales as the ones that actually have the plume. Because you look way cooler with the plume, okay? So the plume comes from the solution that the nicotine is dissolved in, but you could actually put it into water and you would actually just get a mist, but you wouldn't be able to see it, it wouldn't be visible. Okay, then the other one is the little LED light. Um, that's just to tell you that it's on, right? To tell you that it's working, okay? So, in summary, the manufacturers claim that they're a safe alternative, but the FDA has actually questioned it. There are still trace amounts of contaminants that are found. These toxic chemicals and carcinogens are still present in the vaporized nicotine. Now the other one too is, depending upon what the vapor is, like what's the long-term effects of inhaling vaporized propylene glycol? I don't know, no one's really done that study. It's probably going on right now, but nobody's tested it for 20 years. So if you just inhale propylene glycol vaporized, would that cause a problem with the lungs? So let's just put it this way. Um, I just worked with a bunch of colleagues on a, on a proposal where we're going to be evaluating subjects because um, we're nervous about um, fine particulates getting into the small airways. Okay, so if you dig up in the literature of the respiratory disease literature, the history of mining respiratory diseases, okay? So things that are smaller than a micron are the ones that are most problematic in if you have things that are larger than a micron, they usually get trapped by the, the cilia and the mucus. And then on the next, <clears throat> you sort of bring it out. But if it's smaller than a micron, it makes it all the way into the 
a sinus, and they get trapped. And as they get trapped there, it's the alveolar macrophage that takes care of that contaminant, that particle. So my general statement would be anything that you inhale that's a particulate, that's smaller than a micron, that's really not supposed to be there, is probably going to be bad for you. And it's going to cause some sort of respiratory disorder later in life. Okay, so living in polluted cities, is that a problem? Yeah, I would say it is. Air pollution is a problem. Fortunately, we don't have it here in Flagstaff, but maybe the city that you're from does. You know, you've seen some of these pictures of, like, these, these um, um, citizens, like, in different cities, like in Hong Kong or, like, in Tokyo uh, or even in Los Angeles. And they'll wear, like, masks on certain days when there's, like, a pollution advisory. I actually think that's a big deal. I think if you live your whole life in those polluted cities, you're probably going to end up with alveolar macrophage upregulation for a long period of time. And the chances of you developing an emphysema-like disease are very, very high. So I don't think that these things are completely safe. Are they better than cigarettes? Probably. Okay? Just like smoking a cigarette with a filter is better than fil you know, filterless. But um, you're talking now about shades of gray. Uh, because anything that's going in as a particulate into the lungs that shouldn't be there, if it's smaller than a micron, you don't have a great way of getting rid of it, other than the alveolar macrophage. Okay. So, I love these, these old clinical pictures, because it'd be like, if this, this dude is like sitting in the room, it's, yeah, he'd be like, oh my gosh, that's you. Oh my gosh, it's totally you, look at that. <laughs> so, you can't tell who it is, because his eyes are blocked off. But, um, the clinical features of emphysema patients, Right? So shortness of breath, dyspnea. Um, they tend to be, uh, have a pink coloration to their skin because they have a high exertion or work required to breathe. So they're, they're called pink puffers because they have to kind of sit forward in a hunched over position to force the air out. They tend to be barrel chested and the reason for the barrel chestedness is they have a difficulty in breathing, and so they tend to breathe at the upper end. Their tidal volume is way up high. So here, here's what it's going to feel like. Ready? Everybody sit up. I'm going to have you take a deep breath, and I want you to blow out maybe just like, um, not all the way, not even halfway, but like maybe what you feel is about 20%. So take a deep breath, breathe. Blow out about 20% and then breathe in and out at that air volume. Like, so you breathe out, in, out, and then you're breathing way up here. You see how your, your, your chest is kind of, it feels weird because you can't exhale the rest of it. Okay, so that's kind of what a patient with emphysema feels like. They're breathing way up here. So it's a deep breath. You only breathe out a little bit and then. <coughs> oh man, I can't do that really. Stay up. Vapor. <laughs> so over time, they're going to lose weight. They lose a tremendous amount of weight because of all of the energy that's being used to breathe. It's not efficient. And so it's a high metabolic demand just to take a breath. Okay? It's almost like they're exercising when they're breathing. So a lot of weight loss, and they have a lot of loss of skeletal muscle as a result of hypoxia, because they're not able to oxygenate the, oxygenate the tissues very well. Okay, so if we contrast this to chronic bronchitis, like I was talking about. So we've got pure emphysema over here on the right, and you can tell it's emphysema because we have these sort of blown out alveoli. We've got the acinus, the respiratory bronchial alveolar ducts, and the alveoli, uh, modify, uh, loss of elastic recoil, that's just what we came from. Over here on pure chronic bronchitis, we have a slightly different phenotype. So these guys, or gals, usually present with a persistent cough, a persistent productive cough. What does that mean? Well, they're, they're coughing, but they get up like a phlegm, okay? 
And 90% of them are smokers with, with uh, chronic bronchitis. Now, some of you are like, how is that different than like last winter I didn't have pneumonia but I had bronchitis? Well, that's not chronic bronchitis because you got over it, right? Chronic bronchitis means that the way that you felt at that moment is the way that you'll feel forever. You're like, that sucks. I'm like, yes. So actually, last winter I had bronchitis, like actual bronchitis. They thought I had pneumonia, I didn't. I had bronchitis. I even got a flu shot, which I'm really pissed about. I think I got a phony one. Um, but it hurt, like I felt the needle, like I know what it is. So chronic bronchitis is, it never, goes away, it never ceases. Productive cough, a lot of mucus that's being secreted uh, in the airways, that's why you're getting a lot of phlegm that's coming up. There's significant inflammation that takes place in the large airways. These airways are really irritated. Down at the smaller airways, the bronchioles, you can get peribronchial fibrosis. So around the bronchial itself, it starts to scar. Now not in bronchitis that I had last winter, but in chronic bronchitis, because of this long-term inflammation, now you're getting remodeling, and you get the scarring of the airway. And you know that when you hear the word fibrosis and scar, you know that that's not gonna go away. That's permanent, right? We've got an airway obstruction that takes place because you get a lot of scarring and fibrosis that starts to restrict down that airway. Um, ultimately, to what we call chronic bronchiolitis, okay? So this is inflammation of the bronchioles over a long period of time, and that's where that scarring comes from. So there's a couple of different types. Simple, mucus is present, and airflow is not obstructed. Chronic asthmatic, you have intermittent bronchiospasms associated with the symptoms of bronchitis. So not, not only do you have scarring and inflammation and mucus production, you actually get bronchial constriction that takes place. And then chronic obstructive, the mucus is so darn thick with chronic obstructive that it actually blocks the respiratory tree. And this is a classic example of what happens with long-term smokers, which should make sense because if you're bringing in these irritants on a regular basis, your, your airways are going to respond by upregulating mucus production to try to get them out. Make sense? You've heard of the smoker's cough, right? That smoker's cough, which is kind of like this rattling cough, and it feels like, you know, every time you cough, you wonder where the loogie is and what happened to it, okay? So chronic obstructive is kind of that classic smoker's cough um, that we've experienced. Now, in reality, we're saying pure and pure. So just read the exam carefully, because if I'm asking for only one or only, only the other, then I want you to be able to compare and contrast. The reality is, most of the time in, in your patients, you're going to see some combination of the two. You're going to see a patient that presents with um, emphysema-like symptoms, and they have this like productive long-term smoker's cough that has been in existence for, for a number of years. So they probably have chronic bronchitis and they have evidence of emphysema, like the alveoli are starting to blow out. <clears throat> so they probably have both. But if we stick with just pure chronic bronchitis, pathogenesis, well, the pathogenesis is we actually lose, this is a normal, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium that lines the bronchial tree. And it doesn't line, it stops before you get to the respiratory bronchioles. But you lose this type of epithelium. Actually, there's a lot of agents within cigarette smoke that actually paralyze the cilia. And that cilia is called that respiratory escalator. You guys remember about that? So that cilia, they, they kind of do a sweeping motion in upwards. So as you get something in and stuck there on the mucus, it sweeps it up. So when you <clears throat> cough and you bring it out, 
it's that cilia that's helping to encourage it to move out. So there are a couple of toxins within cigarette smoke that paralyze those cilia. So your respiratory escalator is actually compromised, number one. Number two is it gets so full of mucus that it can't move it effectively. So full of chronic bronchitis where it blocks it. Okay, and, and you can tell that this is a goggle cell right here. This, this opening right here, all of this white stuff in here is all the mucus. It gets dumped out onto the surface of this uh, respiratory escalator. Uh, and so here you can see mucus, 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 mucus. This is normal. This is how it's supposed to be. And it's secreted when it's needed. But in a smoker with chronic bronchitis, it actually is secreted on a regular basis. We can get um, an environmental trigger that takes place in a lot of these smokers, uh, where we've got a gene that we've identified as the mucin gene, and that increases goblet cell production of mucus. And the environmental trigger that's often um, associated with that is a panel of toxins that are found in cigarette smoke. Okay? So if they're also found in, in, in the nicotine that's put into the vapor, um, devices, then you would have some of that mucin gene uh, pathway um, available to be problematic in even long-term vapor patients. Um, but once this trigger takes place where you increase the production of mucus out of the goblet cells, you get hypertrophy of the submucosal gland. So these goblet cells actually get bigger. They enlarge because you're telling the body, turn on more mucus production. It begins in the larger airways, and then it moves into the smaller airways, and oftentimes infection is going to um, follow. So if we look at this picture, this histology, we've got a um, bronchus with an increased number of inflammatory cells. The bronchus is right here. Okay, so this opening that's white right here on the lower right, this whole area should be white. And all of these purple dots are all alveolar macrophages that are inside the airway. Okay, and this would be classic of what you would see within chronic bronchitis. What do these patients look like? These patients <clears throat> have different clinical features. They're more blue or cyanotic in appearance. Usually, they're cyanotic because they, um, the airways themselves close almost during exhalation. So the increase in CO2 as a result of not being able to blow it off tells the body that it's um, hypercapnic, high levels of CO2. And so that leads to this bluish tint to the skin. Okay, so we call them blue book bloaters. Um, it's often common to see bronchitis and emphysema together. Okay, but I was trying to compare and contrast. I want you to learn the two separate and then read very carefully the exam questions. Um, again, we talked about cough with sputum. That's a productive cough. And they have shortness of breath upon exertion. Shortness of breath. These patients with um, chronic bronchitis tend to be a little bit more heavy than patients that have pure emphysema. So the emphysema patient that's only emphysema tends to be very, very fit because they're, they're working much harder on every exhalation. In the case of chronic bronchitis, they tend to be a little bit more obese. Uh, they're not working as hard, they're just not breathing. They can't. The airway shut off, and so they get more blue in coloration. Whereas the pure emphysema patient is a little bit more pink in color because of, you know, they're pushing so hard to try to get the air out. Okay? These are general stereotypes, I understand that, but I'm uh, just kind of giving you some ideas of how this plays out. So let's take a break at this point where we compare and contrast emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and we'll come back and finish out our obstructive pulmonary diseases part two.